911, where is your emergency? My mom! My mom was here on the floor! I said it had to be somebody that loved her. Is an Iowa son a seed of evil? It's a case of murder on the farm. She is gone because someone shot her. Yes, you did, Jason. And he told me that if I didn't get on the bus, that he was going to make sure I was under the bus. I asked why he didn't farm together with his dad. And his response was, I can't because my mom is a bitch. There's only two people in this world who know what happened on June 19, 2015. And one of them is dead, and the other one's sitting behind me. The killer is still out there that shot her! Okay, your wife is in a barn, so This is what he's gonna tell you. How to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We the jury to find the defendant. Where is your emergency? Yeah, I, I need a, I need, I need an ambulance, man. Okay, well, to what address? 132 Perry Street. <laughs> it was the Iowa farm home of Shirley and Bill Carter, their son Jason, describing a horrible scene. My mom, my mom was laying here on the floor, blood through blood, where she's dead. I don't know what happened. Jason's father, Bill Carter, was next to arrive. And I went right in the kitchen, and there she lay. And I said, I'm so sorry, Mama. Shirley Carter's murder in her remote Western Iowa farmhouse devastated and ultimately would destroy her family. It's really like the most horrific nightmare you could ever imagine to lose someone that you love so dearly and then um, your family to be just shredded, ripped apart. She would be ashamed of how her family has fallen apart. At the age of 67, Shirley Carter had raised three children, always busy with her grandchildren and still active on the farm with her own John Deere tractor to help in the family's 900 acres of soybean and corn. She was a hard worker, that's for sure. And uh, she loved her grandkids and, you know, I miss her. Her husband of 52 years, Bill, actually talked of suicide. Well, I, I thought I'd lost everything, everything. I, I never had any trouble in my life. Even when we had to get married young, we never had trouble. And then for something like this to happen in our old age, it, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. And as Bill Carter replayed in his mind the image of his wife's body that terrible morning in the kitchen, he began to wonder. Because she was laying face up, and her hands were like this across her chest, and her eyes were open. And I thought, you don't die that way. And I said to Jason, I said, it had to be somebody that loved her. And it was his youngest son, Jason, who found the body and came under suspicion almost immediately, as the lead detective, Mark Ludwig, would later testify. He was immediately on my radar, even before I uh, arrived on the scene. Ludwig had listened to Jason's 911 call as he drove to the scene, and something did not sound right to him. I don't know what I And right away that set bells off to me, uh, in my mind, of his words that he used, uh, how he described the scene, um, and uh, his emotions. What do you think? What do you think? Two hours! <laughs> How would Jason know she had been there for two hours? He's attempting to introduce that she uh, has been dead for two hours when he had a solid alibi. Two hours earlier, Jason Carter was seen on video at a grain elevator. 
but Agent Ludwig remained suspicious. My experience tells me that if, if a person goes into great detail of the crime scene, that that is abnormal. You don't do that when you just find your mother dead on the floor, uh, unless they're trying to be deceitful. Adding to the questions about Jason was a secret he had kept from police and his wife, a torrid extramarital affair. A secret revealed when police discovered a phone he had hidden under the hood of his truck in the fuse box. It was a phone he had been using to send text to the local woman with whom he was having the affair. Since I didn't bring that to their attention right out of the gate, um, I guess they just assumed that I was uh, nothing but a liar and uh, a liar and a cheat. And for, uh, for that reason, uh, the lead investigator just zeroed in right on me and uh, never lost focus. Within three days of the murder, both Jason Carter and his wife Shelly were in the back of a patrol car being brought into the local sheriff's office for questioning. They took me into a small courtroom there at the sheriff's office. And, you know, I, I will never forget that. You know, and they told me about Jason having an affair. And of course it was, you know, just like, to be honest, you know, just so disappointing. And, um, more than anything, just heartbreaking. Down the hall in the sheriff's office, Jason Carter was in the middle of what would be an almost 11 hour interrogation. So you'd have my deepest sympathy, you really do. Thanks. Okay. He was asked and agreed to take a lie detector test. Okay, lean back, try and relax. So we'll begin the test. I'll have your feet flat on the floor. I'll look straight ahead and answer no to each question. Okay. Had me sit there, put the gizmo, put everything on me, and basically started to ask me questions. While the test was underway, elsewhere in the sheriff's office, lead investigator Mark Ludwig was trying to get Shelley Carter to turn on her husband. Mark Ludwig threatened me. And he told me that if I didn't get on the bus, that he was going to make sure I was under the bus. and. I started to say to myself, something's terribly wrong here. Shelley was confident her husband would pass the lie detector test and everyone could go home. Okay. Regarding the death of your mom, do you intend to answer each question truthfully? Yes. Okay. Did you physically hurt your mom? No. Okay. Now this is important. When I say physically hurt your mom, okay, I want you to know exactly what I mean. What I mean is, did you cause her death? No. Okay. Do you know for a fact who hurt your mom? No. Okay. Once again, I'm not, I don't want to know if you have an opinion or I think this guy. Take the question of what it means. Do you know for a fact who hurt your mom? No. Okay. Can that test, please? Go. Right after the test was over, he left the room for maybe less than five minutes. He came back in and uh, he said, The month of July is a pivotal one for Iowa farmers. All eyes on the weather. Producers obviously watching the weather and... And on corn and soybean prices. So USDA upping its corn price forecast by a dime to an average 360, which would be four cents higher. But at the Carter farm in Lacona, Iowa, as they mourned the death of Shirley Carter, the anxiety was over the growing suspicion by the family about Jason Carter's role in her murder. You gotta remember he's still my son and he was my favorite son. I always thought he'd farm with me someday. Jason Carter was at the sheriff's office about to learn how he did on the lie detector test. We, we score them in three different ways, okay? You can show non-deception, which means that we don't see any variation. Inconclusive, which means we're not sure. Or deception, which means we haven't heard the whole story yet. And you were deceptive. 
The lie detector test was a, a crock of shit. That lie detector test was 110% wrong. So, ha, I don't know. Uh, they sure tried their damnedest to get me to uh, fess up to something I didn't do. And state police agent Mark Ludwig used the results to bear down on Jason Carter. Jason, what are the two things that you were deceptive on? Do you positively know who did this? No! Well, according to the test, you do. Well, okay. those, that damn thing is wrong! It's not wrong. It is too! It's not wrong. I never touched my mom! I never hurt her! The killer is still out there that shot her! So, back to the beginning. What happened at your mom's house? She was shot dead. I understand that, Jason. We, we need to get to the truth here. I, that is the truth. You know, I think my, so. That I that walked in the door and, and my mom was laying in a Jason, pool of blood. But Agent Ludwig says he knew that was not true. The way he describes the body on the floor and still bleeding um, gave me great concern when I arrived on scene and looked in the window as there's not blood everywhere. There's very minimal blood uh, on the crime scene. Okay, I walked in and found that. my mom dead, and that's it, Jason, period. That's not true. That is the truth. It's not true, Jason. That is to the truth. It's not true, Jason. We need to get past that, and we need to get to what the truth is. I'm telling you the truth, the God-awful God truth. truth. I'm telling you the truth. You're not telling me the truth, Jason. Yes, I am. Jason Carter was getting increasingly frustrated and angry with Mark Ludwig. That guy is, uh, in my opinion, he, uh, pretty much the devil. I don't know how else to say it. You're the, the one filing the polygraph examination. Have Nobody done. else fits those things. Jason, I'm confident. I agree, poor mom. She doesn't deserve this. Exactly. She doesn't deserve, she doesn't what deserve her. If she, she could talk right now, she'd strike both your asses dead because she knows I didn't do that. Okay? She does know. She would strike both your asses dead because I didn't do this. Jesus. And if you keep blaming me, I guarantee both of you will go to hell because I didn't do a damn thing to my mom. Well, Jason, I'm going to keep telling you you did it because you did it. No, I did. And together we can get past this. <sighs> but you condemning me to hell isn't going to change the facts of what occurred. One of the facts was how the Carter house appeared to have been ransacked, something Jason Carter pointed out to his father right away that morning. Then he said, Dad, look, somebody's robbed you. And when I went into my office, all my drawers had been pulled out and dumped, just dumped. They hadn't went through anything. They were just dumped. And then he said, let's go in the bedroom. When her drawer where she keeps her bras and her panties was open and nothing was taken, her purse was hanging on our granddaughter's high chair. And she had $140 cash in it and she had credit cards in there and none of it had been touched. So it, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. It made sense to Agent Ludwig. The crime scene is that of, of a adolescent mindset. I need to stage this ro robbery. I need to uh, make this look like a robbery. And um, at that point, no one knew the bedroom was ransacked other than Jason Carter. So how, how was he known privy to that information when nobody else was? Another question, how was Jason Carter able so quickly to discover a bullet hole in the floor and another one in the refrigerator? You know what, I've done this a very long time. And you're right, people do re react with disbelief and stuff when they find a body like that, you know what they don't do? They don't survey a crime scene and start telling me where bullet holes are at, Jason. That's what they don't do. The gun used to kill Shirley Carter was never found, but Jason early on suggested it was a hunting rifle found missing from his father's gun safe in the basement. 
What, what do you think was used to shoot your mom? I think that 270 rifle was used to shoot my mom. It was a Remington bolt action 270 like this one. Where did it go? You tell me. I don't know. I think you know that's the murder weapon because you know what happened. No, I don't. Clearly, I believe Jason Carter knows exactly where that gun was on that crime scene. Um, he placed that gun somewhere. I don't know where he put it. Agent Ludwig and a second agent went around and around with Jason Carter into the evening. These two guys were in my face a foot away, just, just ripping into me, saying, you know, you did this, you know you did this. This doesn't matter. My mom is gone, and you, and have you a... can't tell the truth. You're Bullshit. Right. Bullshit. You're right. Your Bullshit. mom is gone. She is gone because someone shot her. Yes, you did, Jason. And no, you I step didn't. up and take responsibility for your actions. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you people? I would never harm a hair on my mom's head. It was only after Jason's wife, Shelly, demanded to talk to him on the phone that the agents gave up on their efforts to break him, to get a confession. She demanded uh, that I, you know, she was either coming in or I was coming out. She said she wants me to quit talking to you and we get out now. That's fine. Like I told you from the very beginning or whatever, you're more than welcome at any time. Okay. I mean, uh, I'll go. But I don't have anything to hide, Mama. I told him there's no way I'd hurt my mom. So uh, that's when I got up and I walked out. I never had my doubts about Jason's involvement with his mom. Now, did I have doubts about our marriage? Huh, you're not kidding. I mean, you know, just what a disappointment. But I couldn't, listen, I could have been a scorned wife because that's what Mark Ludwig wanted me to be. But I was raised that you do things because you know they're right. And I knew that he didn't have anything to do with his mom's death. So, it wouldn't be right for me to be a scorned wife and say, you cheated on me. Now you can pay for your mom's death. That wouldn't be right. It didn't have anything to do with it. She was ready to go to war for the man who had cheated on her. And she would have to. <laughs> The first thing that just stood out about this case was the unimaginable tragedy of a man losing his wife of 52 years and coming slowly to the conclusion in the days after the homicide that his son was the killer. Well, I wanted some kind of justice for my wife, some kind of justice. I didn't want her dying. and no justice whatsoever. You go out there with your family and we'll, we'll chat. But his son Jason Carter had walked out of the sheriff's office with no criminal charges filed, even after he failed the lie detector test. The police didn't do a good job. So Bill Carter hired his own private detective to investigate and re-examine the evidence in the case. The thing that took Bill down the path of believing that Jason was the killer was the evidence. Starting with what Jason had said about the gun safe in the basement where one rifle, the likely murder weapon, had gone missing. And they said, we don't know anything about a gun safe. We don't know anything at all about a gun safe. I didn't even know he had a damn gun safe till just recently. Well, I knew that was a lie because I knew they had gotten it for me for Christmas. A photograph would later be found of Jason and his then toddler son assembling the gun safe for him on Christmas morning. He and his wife both lied constantly and that made it easier for me to tell the truth about what happened. And more troubling to him, Bill Carter wondered how his son seemed to know right away that morning the 
that Shirley Carter had been shot twice. There was no way you would know that unless you did it. And then I knew that he did it. I knew he did it, or hired it done, one or the other. And both Bill Carter and Agent Mark Ludwig agreed on the motive for the murder, the affair Jason was having. I believe he needed to stop his mom from telling his dad that he's having an affair. I have no time for that. And he knew it too. I think he meant to kill both of us. I do. I think he was going to club me with something and then put a gun in my mouth. All this time, Jason was back on his farm, tending to his fields, well aware that his father was turning on him. He looked at me, and I've seen that look, I don't know, I couldn't tell you how many other times of uh, when he's just sure about something. And uh, he said, uh, he looked at me, and he said, you know, I've got it figured out. It had been more than a year, a full season of planting and harvest, when Bill Carter gave up on the criminal investigation and decided to take his son to court. Bill decided to take matters into his own hands, and so he filed the lawsuit. A civil action against his son, Jason, blaming him for Shirley Carter's wrongful death, the subject of the last conversation father and son ever had. And then he said, what are you going to do today, Dad? And I said, I'm going up to see my lawyer. And he hit the, he hit the counter, the kitchen counter, hard. And he said, my life is over. My life is over. For five days in the Marion, Iowa County Courthouse, a civil trial that pitted father against son over the murder of the mother, a family tragedy. Jesus, you know, what father does this to their child? What father does this? The case received national attention. Say a son killed his mother because he was going bust. She was just laying there uh, looking off like, and I knelt down. And I grabbed her pant leg and shook it and said, Mom, you know, hoping she'd respond somehow. Did you scream? No. Were you, were you crying? You know, I, I was, I, I think I, I don't, it was just shock. In reality, killers come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, what I'll tell you is that Jason came across to us in the civil trial as number one, highly insincere, and number two, uh, very shifty. Jason Carter's lawyers were convinced it was a ploy to spur a criminal charge against Jason. We know that the prosecutor was sitting in the civil trial the entire time, taking notes, so in our opinion, law enforcement, the state of Iowa, and Bill Carter worked hand in hand. A civil trial has a lower standard of proof than a criminal trial, but still it was no slam dunk. Convincing a jury that a son is going to kill his mother in the kitchen of the farmhouse where that son was raised just sounds like quite a mountain to climb. But the jury took only two hours to reach a verdict. I guess I had a bad gut feeling, and uh, you know, my gut feeling was spot on. Jason Carter, guilty, liable, ordered to pay $10 million. When they came back uh, with that $10 million judgment, uh, I kind of figured everything was gonna go to hell from there. And it did. The prosecution now decided it had enough evidence to charge Jason Carter with murder. His nemesis, Agent Mark Ludwig, made sure he was the one to put Carter in handcuffs in front of Carter's teenage son. And he said, I've been waiting two and a half years to do this. He said, do you have anything to say, you pussy? Now, much
much more was at stake than a $10 million judgment. Jason Carter, if found guilty, would be sentenced to prison for the rest of his life with no chance of parole. Opening statements this afternoon, is an Iowa son a seed of evil? It's a case of murder on the farm. But even before the trial began, behind the scenes, Jason Carter had to consider a possible plea deal. Jason had to make some very difficult decisions. Five years or so in prison instead of a possible life sentence with no parole, a tempting deal. Boy, you know, you, you're, a person's pretty leery uh, after going through a civil suit and them taking two hours to come up with a, a, a guilty, you, you know, you, you just hate to put your hands into, uh, into the jury again. But his wife, Shelly, put her foot down. No way in hell, because Jason already spent five days in jail. And I said to him, you're not gonna spend another day, not one more day, in jail or prison for something you didn't do. Your mom wouldn't be okay with it. I'm not okay with it. You're coming home to us. So the trial began. On behalf of the state, you may read the charge and make your opening statement. Ed Bull, the county attorney, began by describing Jason Carter as a man who acted out of greed, who may have actually planned to kill both his parents to get his hands on their farm valued at six million dollars. They weren't ready to retire and let Jason Carter have Carter Farms. So you might be wondering, if Jason Carter couldn't run Carter Farms instead of his parents, why didn't he just run Carter Farms with his parents? Jason Carter, the man sitting in that chair right there, said he could never go into business with that bitch. For Jason Carter's lawyer, Christine Branstead, it was essential for her to paint a different picture of the relationship between Jason and his mother. And Jason Carter was a son who loved his mother, spent a lot of time with her. Essential for the defense to get ahead of what they knew was testimony coming about the mother-son relationship. The state calls uh, Brandon Smith, Your Honor a local farm equipment salesman, Brandon Smith, who knew the family and Jason well. I asked why he didn't farm together with his dad, and his response was, I can't because my mom is a bitch. Did it surprise you when he said that? A little, yes. Why? Um, I have known Shirley about as long as Bill, and it was just, she didn't strike me as that person. Um, I've, I guess I just didn't realize that that was how he felt, I guess. Kind of took me back a little. The defense was braced for the prosecution's strongest witness. State of Iowa calls Bill Carter. If I can get you to raise your right hand for me, please, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. The testimony of Jason's father, Bill Carter. That was my biggest concern going into the trial, is that a jury would think, well, if the father thinks he did it, he must have done it. The prosecutor began with questions to back up the alleged motive, money. Did you start to have concerns that Jason was going to struggle to pay off his farming debts? Yes, I did. Jason, at the time of the murder, was deeply in debt. Bill was interested in farming with Jason to try to help him out. Shirley was dead set against it and did not want Bill and Jason to be farming together. And so Shirley was really the person standing in the way of the solution to Jason's financial problems. How much was he gonna come up short? I assume somewhere between 100 and 150,000. Bill Carter knew his testimony could put his son in prison for life. Yeah, it bothered me. That's just because I loved him. I couldn't, you can't stop loving somebody. He did something terrible, but you can't stop loving somebody. 
and the emotion was raw as the questioning turned to the moment Bill Carter found the body of his wife of 52 years. What did you see? I found Shirley on the floor. And she was just looked like she was sleeping. Her eyes were closed. Her hands were crossed. And her legs were crossed. And I picked her head up. And I held her. For the defense, no piece of evidence was more important than this surveillance video showing Jason Carter at the cargo grain silo between 9 and 10 in the morning, an hour's drive away from his parents' home. Meaning that Jason Carter could not have been at the home at the time that Shirley Carter was killed. And the defense would hammer that point home with their medical expert who testified about how long Shirley Carter had been dead when her body was found. My opinion I would express would be around uh, two hours. The time of death was absolutely crucial and I believe all medical evidence points towards a time of death at the point when Jason Carter would have been at Cargill. Get your, raise your right hand for me please. Do you swear to tell the truth? But the key witness for the defense, not for the prosecution strangely enough, was the state police lead investigator who had focused on Jason. My name is Mark Ludwig. I have never been involved in a case or seen a case of any significance where the state did not call the lead investigator. What the defense wanted to show was a failure by Ludwig and others to follow up on tips from local residents that three area men with long criminal records had killed Shirley Carter during a botched robbery. At least a dozen of those people say that it was a burglary gone wrong, correct? I'm not sure how many people, but yeah, burglary gone wrong was something that we knew At by noon on the day of the homicide was gone around the small community. But again? Not to my knowledge. And again? I don't remember. And again? I don't know. The agent was stymied by the questions. I'm, I'm definitely confused at this point. Or could not remember. But I've done a lot of super stuff in my career and during interviews, and so I'd hope I wouldn't have done that. What we were able to show is that they weren't fully investigated, and the door was open that they or anyone else could have been guilty. None of the three men was ever charged in connection with the murder. Prosecutor Ed Bull sought to set the record straight. Were there any alternative suspects that came to light? Not from anyone other than Jason Carter. Sir, has there been anyone during the investigation of the death of Shirley Carter that provided information that was consistent with what you found at the crime scene? Yes. Who was that person? Jason Carter. Jason Carter ever shed a tear? Not once, never, until this courtroom. So now the stage was set for Jason Carter to take the stand and once again attest to his innocence. The day began with a surprise move by Jason Carter's lawyers. And your honor, the defense rests. Very well meaning Jason Carter was not going to testify in his own defense. We had never really considered the idea of not putting Jason on the stand until the very end of the trials. His lawyers thought they had a winning hand and did not want to let Prosecutor Ed Bull have a go at Jason. Lawyers are tricky, and the prosecutor is an excellent lawyer. And there's a good chance that he could have, you know, made Jason say something or that Jason would have gotten confused by the questioning. Ladies and gentlemen, that means the evidence is done. Um, as the saying goes, it's all over but the shouting. So it was straight to the closing arguments. There's no dispute someone committed murder in the first degree. The question is, the who is that somebody? But the prosecutor knew there was no physical evidence from the crime scene to connect Jason Carter. 
no fingerprints, no weapon. And the jury was not told about Carter failing the lie detector test. Well, those, that damn thing is wrong! Nor would the judge let the prosecutor reveal some other key facts about Jason. The jury didn't hear about the affair. The jury had a much more limited understanding of Jason's financial circumstances and the family strife that that caused. And so the jury had a much weaker understanding of why Jason would have done this. It was a circumstantial evidence case based largely on surmise. How does Jason Carter know his parents' bedroom is ransacked for any other reason than Jason Carter is the one who did it? And the prosecutors scoffed at the defense position that law enforcement failed to investigate other possible suspects, calling it a distraction. The only reason that story, these alternative suspects make sense is because it's an attempted burglary. Well, who caused the attempted burglary? Jason Carter, by staging. And finally, to Jason's relationship with his mother. There was friction. We got told we were going to hear this story about this loving family with no conflict. And what you heard was just the opposite from Mr. Carter, Bill, and from Brandon Smith. My mom is a bitch. There's only two people in this world who know what happened, and one of them is dead, and the other one's sitting behind me. Based on the evidence, and in support of that evidence, the state of Iowa requests that you find Jason Carter guilty of murder in the first degree. I believe we are ready for closing statement on behalf of the defendant, Ms. Branstad. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. This was a case built against Jason Carter instead of a case trying to solve a crime and look at all the clues. And let's look at all the other leads that weren't followed. There were so many statements made about three individuals who don't have an alibi. And then the defense's other main point, the video showing Jason Carter at the Cargill Grain Elevator, pulling away in his semi-truck just before 10 in the morning, about an hour's drive away from his parents' home. Rest assured, the state has not had anyone who testified they believe Shirley Carter died after 1030. Not one. There's no one who says they believe that time of death was later. But any one of those means Jason Carter could not have been there. And at the end of this case, there are so many holes in this investigation. There's so much that isn't even explored. And in reality, the forensic evidence not only says that there's reasonable doubt, the forensic evidence says Jason Carter couldn't possibly be guilty. Shirley Carter died long before that, probably while he was at Cargill on video. I ask you to return a verdict of not guilty. As the jury went out to deliberate, our main hope was that they would look at the evidence and the lack of evidence and that they wouldn't be distracted by a family that had turned against Jason. As the jury was deliberating his fate, Jason Carter was nervous, preparing for prison. You know, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. He sent text messages to his teenage son, Chase, and five-year-old daughter, McKenna just in case. I said, Daddy loves you very much, and that I would, uh, I'll be home to see you soon. That was real hard, but I felt like I needed to do that because you never know what a jury's thinking. He found out just two hours later. You may be seated, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, have you reached a verdict? And so I prepared Jason for the worst possible verdict and made some requests that he not overreact if he got a negative verdict. Form of verdict number one. He was shaking, 
gray, I have no color in his skin at all. We, the jury, find Jason Carter not guilty. Um, is that your verdict, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, it is. Mr. Bull, do you care to have the jury polled? No, sir. Very well. <clears throat> started to cry visibly and I think it was just the release of the pressure and the tension and what he had gone through. And then kisses from the wife who had stood by him through it all. ...of acquittal, uh, any bond previously posted by the defendant uh, will be released and exonerated. Um, anything further on behalf of the defendant at this point, Ms. Branstead? No, Your Honor. On behalf of the state? His father, Bill, was devastated. They took me out of the courtroom as fast as they could get me out of there. The DA took me downstairs where I cried. I knew it was over with. After the verdict, prosecutor Ed Bull said he remained certain Jason Carter was the killer. I wouldn't have signed my name to the trial information and brought this case if I did not believe Jason Carter was responsible. We want to be certain we have the right guy. And we, we were certain we did. The jury saw it differently. And I loved my wife. I loved her dearly. And I was afraid what would happen is exactly what happened. I, would, I was afraid there would be no verdict. And now she's uh, what you call a cold case. She's a cold case. The anger and the bitterness and the legal drama with the Carter family is still far from over. Jason and Shelley are suing his father, the state of Iowa, and agent Mark Ludwig, who declined to comment. We want a new set of eyes on this case in the worst way. We want an investigator who is going to investigate. We're over five years now, and we're still fighting. And um, you know what, I tell you what, we're not about to stop. Ladies and gentlemen, over the course of the next two weeks or so, you're going to go on a journey back in time. The 40-year-old cold case dating back to 1979. Michelle Martinko. Old Michelle Martinko. Old Michelle Martinko. Are you confident that this case will be solved? No. Why can't they figure this out? How did he get away with this? Police officers arrived to find that she had been stabbed well over 20 times. It was local lore. We all knew who Michelle Martinko was. Tonight, stunning news decades after her murder. New information from DNA evidence. Our jaws were on the floor because that was the first time in 40 years that we had ever received an answer like we'd received. And they have found the killer's DNA that her suspect was likely one of three brothers, all living in Iowa. Which one is it? On December 19th, 1979, the world was Michelle Martinko's for the taking. Instead, she was taken from the world. This is what he's gonna tell you. Get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We, the jury, need to find the defendant. It was 1979 what would be a tumultuous, soul-searching year for America. All the legislation in the world can't fix what's wrong with America. Iran 1979. The United States suffered its most serious commercial nuclear power plant accident. The long lines which have made millions of you spend aggravating hours waiting for gasoline. It is a crisis of confidence. A year that saw the crime rate climbing especially in the country's smaller cities, including Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Especially around here, folks thought they could just kind of 
go about their lives uh, uh, as they always had for for decades here and not have to worry about the violence that happens in those bigger you know, cities. All that changed in Cedar Rapids one week before Christmas in 1979 at the brand new Westdale Mall. A high school student brutally murdered, her body discovered in her car in the parking lot. Our uniform division people went out there to check and check various places. They checked there and did, in fact, uh, discover the uh, uh, body of one Michelle Martinko. Any motive at all? Can you, can you think of any reason why anyone would want to kill her? No, from what uh, our understanding is a, a, a very nice young lady. Uh, it's a sad situation. Uh, we have no idea at this point. No idea. And it would stay that way for almost 40 years. Until Michelle Martinko's killer was finally tracked down by a detective, Matt Denlinger, who was just a child at the time of the murder. I, I was probably at home in bed. Uh, in 1979, I would have been five years old. The prosecutor who would handle the case, Nick Baybanks, was even younger four years old. We were all aware of it uh, growing up in Cedar Rapids. It was, it was local lore. We all knew who Michelle Martinko was. She had gone to the mall for some Christmas shopping with $180 in her purse. And, and this being a brand new mall with 100 plus stores, you know, at the weeks that lead up to Christmas, you know, a lot of people are there for the first time. Michelle Martinko had come from a school choir holiday banquet and was all dressed up. She um, has been described by her friends as being kind of a girly girl, someone who enjoyed wearing evening clothes and things like that. Uh, she was uh, bright, she was friendly, she stood out in the crowd. Of course, she was also beautiful. As a matter of fact, the night that uh, my sister went to the mall, that was the first time she had ever been there and had the $180 cash on her for that evening, and she still had the money with her after she was, after she was killed. The last person to talk to her that night was Kurt Thomas, who had been in a school play with Michelle and was working at a men's clothing store in the mall. We were walking and looking at each other and, and animated and just friendly. Thomas walked her to the mall exit. She was saying her goodbyes, she was bundling up, she was calling it a night, and going out in that parking lot, she smiled at me. I call it the Michelle smile. The next time that she was seen was when uh, police officers arrived, of course, on the scene at about 4 a.m. the next morning to find that she had been stabbed uh, well over 20 times throughout her chest, her neck. Uh, in her arms, um, and that she had been uh, she had been brutally murdered. She was in a battle for her life as she was uh, being stabbed to death. She was a good looking gal, real good looking. I understand. Gal. Yes, I understand she was. Any possibility of uh, of sexual assault here? I would at this point, and I, and I certainly can stand to be corrected. I would say possibly not. Uh, I don't think robbery is a motive. We don't know at this time. Michelle's family, including her sister and brother-in-law, were convinced it was an ex-boyfriend, Andy Seidel, who had killed her. Well, we'd, we really didn't have any other suspects. And they had broken up in a rather unsatisfactory way, and he wouldn't let go, and just seemed like the classic behavioral trait of, uh, you know, if I can't have her, no one can. But detectives were also suspicious of the friend she had talked to at the mall that night, Kurt Thomas. It turned into a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. Thomas was taken to the police station even before he knew Michelle had been killed. The one thing I do remember was the good cop, bad cop. He just flat turned around, leaned over the chair, and asked me why I killed her. But there were no surveillance cameras in the mall parking lot no eyewitnesses, and at the time, no DNA testing was available. No way to rule in or rule out Kurt Thomas or any of Michelle's friends. The case went cold. The theories that were floating around in town, in that small town, those were very hurtful because it was everything from drug rings to prostitution, I mean, you name it. And for years, her family was in despair especially her mother, Janet, subjected to ugly crank calls after the murder. And they'd say what? 
Mother. Mother. It's Michelle. Do things like that. And some of them would be laughing and on the phone. It was absolutely awful. My sister and my mother were soulmates, and so my mother just lost a part of herself. Are you confident that this case will be solved? No. No, I'm not. The case would remain unsolved for almost four decades before a scientific breakthrough. And they have found the killer's DNA. Now police would know if the alibis of Michelle's friends would hold up. For decades, it became a sad Christmas time ritual in Cedar Rapids. Friends and teachers gathering at the gravesite of Michelle Martinko. There's a lot of people in my life, I can't remember their voice, but I can always remember Michelle's laugh. The community was still struggling to understand her brutal murder just a few days before Christmas in 1979. We still have a really uh, small town like atmosphere here, so you know, uh, when something happens to one of our own, uh, we, we're all impacted by it. The years went by with no solution. Michelle's mother and father, Albert and Janet Martinko, died not knowing who had killed their daughter. I would say it destroyed a lot of their lives, certainly their peace and quiet. This was, my little sister was their miracle baby. Uh, my mother was 44 when she had my sister. The mother's diary, discovered later, indicated that she died thinking it was either the ex-boyfriend Andy or Michelle's friend Kurt Thomas who had killed her. I saw the actual notes that uh, uh, Michelle's mother had made. She thought it was Andy. How did he get away with this and why can't they prove it? But she was keeping a diary and I, it was very troubling to me to see her write my name and then circle it and put question marks. The millennium came and went. America was attacked by terrorists. The country went to war in Iraq, and the most watched television show, CSI, showed how detectives solved crimes using forensics. But in real life, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the murder of Michelle Martinko remained unsolved. I would say we were frustrated. I would say we were very anxious. You know, why can't they figure this out? It turned out the answer had been sitting on a shelf at the Cedar Rapids police station all those years. Evidence from the crime scene that had not yet been tested for DNA until the year 2006 at a CSI-like moment. Some of the items of evidence that we've kept have been re-examined by lab analysts and they have found the killer's DNA. Now anyone who had been suspected or had any contact with Michelle was asked to submit a DNA sample. Of course, one of the first people that the detectives looked at was the boyfriend, and they took a swab from him and was not a match. But eyebrows were immediately raised at police headquarters when one man refused to give a DNA sample. Kurt Thomas, the last person to talk with Michelle at the mall that night now married to a judge in Oklahoma. My wife just was completely silent, and then she was, are you crazy? Are you nuts? The police don't call and ask for DNA, just willy-nilly out of the blue. Thomas's lawyer gave him a statement to read to the police detective who had contacted him, turning down the request for DNA. Read my little statement, and he set the phone down. I could hear the phone going down on the desk, and he just announced it to wherever he was, we got our effing killer. We're gonna get a warrant for your DNA. We're gonna get a warrant for your arrest. I knew I've always liked you as Michelle's killer. But after a prolonged negotiation with the Cedar Rapids police, Thomas's lawyer relented. And uh, I gave my DNA, and I remember they called and just said, he's not a match, and they hung up and no one else was a match either of the hundreds of men tested. They had gone through all of the usual suspect. My husband's DNA was tested. They were even that thorough. Um, 
So there was just nowhere to turn unless it was a total stranger. And then how do you find that person? It was in 2015 that Detective Matt Denglinger took on the cold case, determined to find that total stranger. First, sorting through more than 7,000 pages of reports, including some prepared by his father, who was a detective at the time of the murder. I have to try to find something new to do. I'm really brainstorming. How can we streamline this process? And it was his wife who gave him the answer after she had received a Christmas gift of an Ancestry.com research report on her family tree that used DNA. And at that time, you know, it was kind of a light bulb moment for, for us. She mentioned, you know, wouldn't that be neat if you could do that with your Martenko case? And, and I immediately recognized the potential in that. And that's how I eventually got turned on to a company called Parabon Nano Labs out of Virginia. So we, we actually were able to get an image of our suspect created from that DNA. They're able to create what, what they anticipate someone would look like from their DNA, including skin color, hair color, eye color, um, facial structure, um, things of that nature. It was pretty amazing and, and is not something that had ever been tried here in Iowa. So that generated a whole new flurry of activity. They put out the picture, they had a big press release. We went into Cedar Rapids for that and they aged the person a little bit and did different hairdos. What I was hoping for is that we'd get 100 people call in and say, hey, it, it all looks like person A. But the problem we ran into was we got 200 people call in and say it looks like 100 different people. Another dead end. But Detective Matt Denlinger was far from giving up. In 2018, the spring of 2018, I saw in the news that they had cracked the Golden State Killer case and arrested Joseph D'Angelo. Using the most innovative DNA technology available at this time. Police had matched the DNA found on victims in that case to a relative of D'Angelo, who had submitted her DNA to a genealogy database. It led to his arrest and conviction and a revolution in solving cold cases led by pioneers like C.C. Moore. This technique was really only known to genealogy enthusiasts and people of unknown parentage who used it to find their birth families. We were a relatively small group of citizen scientists that created these techniques and evolved them to the point where they could really be a revolution for crime fighting. And finally, real hope that this would be the key to solving the murder of Michelle Martinko using a database of more than one million people. So what we're looking for are people who have uh, significant amounts of shared DNA with that unknown suspect. And then a hit, a partial match with a woman living in Washington State. She was kind of our ground zero for, for building a family tree and working our way back to our suspect. And so we were, we were honing in pretty quick. The mystery of who killed Michelle Martinko was about to be solved. Our suspect was likely one of three brothers, all living in Iowa. People in Manchester, Iowa and the surrounding Delaware County are proud of their small town values, a family-friendly, safe place in the middle of farm country. And yet police were now certain that this town of 5,000 people was home for a man with a deep and dark secret. If the DNA tests were correct, one of three brothers in the Burns family of Manchester had to be the man who had brutally murdered Michelle Martinko. Jerry Burns, Kenneth Burns, and Donald Burns. And they'd all grown up in the Manchester, Iowa area, which is about 45 minutes from Cedar Rapids. I was convinced that the DNA was telling us that, that it, was, it was gonna be one of these three. After so many dead ends, Detective Matt Denlinger was finally closing in. Matt Denlinger called me on the phone and said that uh, they had narrowed it down to three brothers and uh, uh, we were just excited beyond belief. We stopped and hugged each other and cried a little bit. None of them had any connection to Michelle or to Westdale Mall that we could identify. So it was really tricky to tell 
um, which one we, we thought was most likely our suspect. No criminal records. They were all entrepreneurs. Ken and Jerry still live in Manchester and they both run uh, different businesses. And then Donald was uh, an entrepreneur also and he lived down in uh, Davenport. Well, it was hard to sleep at night. Which one is it? In great secrecy, Cedar Rapids police detectives descended on Manchester. We were on a, a lockdown. No one knew what we were doing or what we were trying to accomplish. We, we wanted as little information getting out as possible. We needed to collect DNA to confirm which one it was. So we had to do that covertly. They began with the brother detectives thought was the most likely suspect, Kenneth Burns in Manchester. We followed him around um, for the better part of a day until he went and had lunch at a golf course clubhouse. And then we were able to collect uh, a drinking straw out of his glass and send that back to the state. The Iowa State Crime Lab in Ankeny made the case a priority and had results within days, comparing the new sample with the DNA collected off Michelle's dress four decades earlier. They told us after comparison that Kenneth was not a match for our suspect. Now to Davenport, along the Mississippi River, where Donald Burns lived. He moved to Davenport with the bright lights of Big City and he, he seemed to me like he was the most logical of the three to have done it. The detectives waited outside his home for Donald Burns' garbage to accumulate. And we were able to covertly collect a glass uh, and a toothbrush out of his garbage and we found out that that's not a match either. Finally, back to Manchester and the brother detectives had thought was the least likely of the three to be the killer one DNA sample away from being arrested. And we observed Jerry leave his business uh, around lunchtime one day, went to the Pizza Ranch uh, buffet restaurant there in Manchester, Iowa. We decided that the straw that he was drinking out of was gonna be the best item to take. And after uh, his lunch was over, uh, they got up and left. And we walked over and took the straw out of the glass after it was left there uh, for trash. Once again, a rush order for the technicians at the Iowa State Crime Lab in Ankeny. And when we got that phone call, it, it, you know, our jaws were on the floor. It was a match. That was big. I wanted to leave the second I got that phone call and go arrest them, but, you know, cooler heads prevailed. The plan instead was for Detective Denglinger and a retired detective who had worked on the case, J.D. Smith, to go back to Manchester. And see what he had to say for himself. So we walked right into the business and uh, knocked on the door to his office. Hey, how are you today? Jerry, my name's Matt. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, I'm with the Cedar Rapids Police Department. Oh, yeah. Uh, no smoke and mirrors, no, no tricks up our sleeve. We're gonna just be honest with you. And, and see what you're willing to tell us. Now at age 64, with a full face and a friendly pet cat, Jerry Burns listened as Denglinger laid out the purpose of the visit, all recorded on an undercover camera. We, uh, we work in the cold case unit mm -hmm. down at Cedar Rapids Police Department, and uh, we're following up on an old case. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard it in the news at all. It's a homicide that happened at Westdale Mall. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Martenko, is that something you've ever heard of? Yeah. First, Denglinger showed Burns a picture of Michelle. This is this is a, a picture of uh, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Is that anyone you ever remember seeing or anything like that? No. Is not, not that's not a name you knew or anything no. like that. Okay. He he actually agreed to to uh, be interviewed for for quite some time. Now Detective Denglinger began to close in, telling Burns he had a warrant to collect a DNA sample from him to make sure there was no doubt. I already knew in the back of my head that Jerry was responsible for killing Michelle. His DNA was on the dress. And then all the cards on the table. Just spitballing here. But I'm just thinking, you know, we, we kind of know going in that this is probably going to be a match. Oh, really? Yeah. Why would that be? Well. We were kind of hoping you'd tell us. The reality is we're not, we're not here on a whim. We're here to confirm what we already know. I already collected some DNA from you that you got rid of before. 
And so uh, I'm telling you, Jerry, I already know that your DNA is going to match the, the DNA that we have on file. Outside, Prosecutor Nick Maybanks was in a surveillance van listening to a live audio feed of the interview. The reality is we're not, we're not here on a whim. I was on pins and needles as I was listening to the interview take place. The date chosen for the confrontation was December 19th, the anniversary of Michelle's murder. It was no coincidence. I mean, I think in any investigation, um, you hope that the suspect confesses. Uh, we thought that, uh, you know, there could be a possibility that that date would have meaning to Mr. Burns. Do you know what today is? 19th of December. Did you murder someone that night, Jerry? Test the DNA. Jerry. Test the DNA. Why did this happen, Jerry? Test what, the DNA. What happened? I don't know. You I was don't... not there that night. You don't know why this happened? I was not there that night. Well, we know better than that, Jerry. You know better than that. You know I'm not lying. He was in denial, full denial mode about having any involvement. I didn't get quite what I wanted, which was just a full confession explanation. Maybe I was overly optimistic I could get that from him, but... One last try. Take a good look at her picture for me, mm -hmm. please. And just really make sure in your mind that this is not someone you know. I don't believe or that so. You met. Um, so eventually we came to the conclusion that he's not gonna provide us any more information and we're not gonna get uh, any more evidence to connect him to Michelle. So at that time, it was, it was decided um, that we were going to arrest him for the murder of Michelle Martenko. Tonight's stunning news of the arrest decades after her murder. Authorities arrested 64-year-old Jerry Lynn Burns of Manchester this morning. He's been arrested for first-degree murder in the stabbing death of Michelle Martenko. But once the case got to the courtroom, it was not so cut and dried. Burns' family was able to hire one of Iowa's top defense lawyers, and the reliability and the constitutionality of the DNA evidence would be put on trial. Without it, a conviction would be impossible. This could not have been Jerry Burns. It just didn't make sense. State of Iowa versus Jerry Lynn Burns. The state of Iowa accuses Jerry Lynn Burns of the crime of murder in the first degree. Michelle Bartinkle's friends and family packed the courtroom to get their first in-person look at the man accused of the brutal murder. Jerry Burns looked like the most ordinary man you've ever met. He looked like he couldn't possibly be a killer. I thought he would be just a monster to look at, but he was just a very low-key, average-looking kind of guy. You would have thought maybe he was in there for a parking ticket. But if convicted, Burns faced life in prison without parole for a crime committed 40 years earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, over the course of the next two weeks or so, you're going to go on a journey back in time. Michelle Martinko was a girl out on the town. She would talk to anyone she considered to be a friendly face. Those in her class, those in the concert choir with her, and those that were in music or on the twirling squad with her. Michelle Martinko, forever 18. And as the lawyer for Jerry Burns, Leon Spees, prepared for his opening statement, he understood the emotional power surrounding the memory of a beautiful teenager whose life was cut short. And no one in this courtroom at any point is going to be critical of Michelle Martinko. There was no reason for her to die, and there was no reason for any violence to be inflicted upon her. To take the jury back in time to 1979, the prosecution began with classmates of Michelle Martinko. She was a real sweet girl. Uh, always upbeat, always dressed impeccably. Including her one-time boyfriend, Andy Seidel. It's hard to characterize someone as good and, and as pure as she was uh, in terms of uh, how she would treat others. You know, Andy was a nervous wreck. Um, 
understandably, not only did he love Michelle back then, but he had went through a lot being, you know, the target of the investigations. And of course, for years, Michelle's family was certain Andy was the killer. After testifying, he left town before Michelle's sister could talk to him. I would have liked to have personally apologized to him for falsely accusing him for all those years and for thinking that he was capable of doing something like that to Michelle. Next to testify was Kurt Thomas, who also had been considered a suspect and was the last person known to have talked to Michelle at the Westdale Mall. I remember that night. I remember Michelle, uh, her smile. Um, the goodbye smile. I mean, it's, it's affected my entire life. Including, he says, a sense of guilt that has weighed on him ever since that night. We lived in an age of innocence, and we didn't think about monsters in the parking lot. And, um, but it has absolutely consumed me that I didn't walk her to the car. If you'd have walked her to the car, it could have all been different. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Now it was time for the jury to hear the four-decade-long detective story as lead detective Matt Denwinger took the stand. Nobody to this day, I think, knows more about this case, including me, than Matt Denlinger. Denlinger described the quest by the Cedar Rapids Police Department over the years to find the killer. This is a, a picture of uh, Michelle leading to Denlinger's secretly recorded confrontation of Burns. The video played almost in full for the jury. And you're under permission to publish and play State's Exhibit uh, 14A, the uh, interview. You may. Hey, how are you today? Burns' lawyer called the video evidence the low point of the trial for their side. Yeah, it was difficult to, uh, to try to uh, predict how the jury was reacting to Mr. Burns' questioning there at his office. The natural reaction, I think, would be to protest loudly, no, I had nothing to do with it. And then the video in the back seat of the police car with Burns under arrest, a barely audible passage when Detective Denlinger asked if he had forgotten what happened. Burns suggested memories can be blocked out block things out of your memories. Oh, you block things out. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Now that we've watched all 56 minutes of this video, Matt, where in the action interaction between you and Mr. Burns in the squad car does he deny killing Michelle Martinko? He never denied it. In this video, does Mr. Burns tell you emphatically that you have the wrong guy? Never. Did he ever say to you this must be some kind of mistake? No. The prosecution played its final card with a surprise witness from inside the county jail, where Burns, in the dark shirt on the left, had been held since his arrest. His cellmate, in the white shirt, turned informant, Michael Allison. He said Burns called him son, and as seen in this surveillance video, even signed a copy of the Cedar Rapids newspaper with a front page story about the Martinko murder case. It says, to my favorite son, Michael, Jerry Burns, but the informant's most damning testimony suggested Burns felt he got away with it. Has uh, Mr. Burns discussed with you uh, his feelings regarding the um, potential outcome of his trial? Yeah, he feels like uh, no matter what happens in this case that he, he wins because he had, had the opportunity to be out there with his family all these years. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. For all the talk about 40 years earlier, it was the modern world's advances in DNA that were at the heart of this trial. And nothing would be more important than Michelle's dress, brought into the courtroom on a mannequin by Detective Denlinger to show the jury where the DNA that matched Jerry Burns' sample had been located. There's a one in 100 billion chance that it would be somebody else. The lawyer for Jerry Burns knew what he was up against. There was no disputing that there was evidence of, the, of Jerry Burns' DNA at the crime scene, but the question was how did it get there, when did it get there? So it was the job of the defense's only witness. The uh, defense called Dr. Michael Spence. 
forensic consultant Dr. Michael Spence to make sure the jury understood what's known as the DNA transfer theory. It can be from coughs, sneezes, uh, speaking as I'm doing right now. I'm sure my DNA is right here on this uh, microphone. And then two hours into his testimony, Dr. Spence was asked the pivotal question. Is it, Dr. Spence, a plausible explanation that the DNA of Jerry Burns found on the dress or on the gear shift could have come about by a transfer? Objection, you know, that is speculation. There's no evidence in the record to suggest that and no foundation to make that opinion, uh, expert or otherwise. Now the defense's entire case strategy depended on the judge's ruling. The witness will be permitted to respond, uh, answer the question, uh, the hypothetical question. Was it plausible that Jerry Byrne's DNA ended up on Michelle Martinko's dress by some sort of innocent transfer? Yes, that's a distinct possibility. Both sides felt they had done enough to win. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, it is the time in the trial for each of the parties to present what's called a closing argument. I was looking over to watch Jerry Burns to see what reaction he had with the presentation of the final argument. Uh, he had no reaction at all. On December 19th, 1979, the world was Michelle Martinko's for the taking. Instead, she was taken from the world. I wanted to bring the jury into the story of where these two lives, these two people, intersected that night. He saw her leaving and he followed her. She's taken by surprise, but she knows that she has to fight. He knows he now must eliminate her because she can identify him. Meanwhile, the killer would be able to go on with his life raise his family, run a business, enjoy those years, no doubt haunted by the prospect of one day receiving a knock on the door that would eventually come. And prosecutor Nick Babings replayed for the jury the video of that day he said the knock did come on the door. Hey, how are you today? Jerry, my name's Matt. Nice to meet you. How would you act if somebody came and said your DNA was on the crime scene, started implying you in a murder. Well, you know what I'd do? I'd say I didn't do it. You got the wrong guy. Not, I don't know. I don't think anything happened. I don't think so. And the prosecutor knew he had the DNA evidence on his side, scoffing at the theory that Burns' DNA was somehow transferred onto Michelle's dress by accident. It's not reasonable. It's not founded in the evidence, and quite frankly, it's not even within the realm of possibilities. The evidence shows, beyond any reasonable doubt, the defendant killed Michelle Martinko. The state of Iowa is asking you to enter a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. Thank you, Mr. Maybanks. But the prosecution case had a glaring hole. Where was the motive? Why did Jerry Burns kill Michelle Martinko? You're Mike Krobanix, you're a former prosecutor. It's tough to prosecute a case against a defendant with only DNA and no really clear motive for this defendant to have killed this victim. I, I couldn't agree with you more. The jury was not shown what prosecutors wanted to present as, in fact, a really clear motive the disturbing internet searches discovered on Jerry Burns' computer about assault, rape, and murder, such as blonde molested after getting strangled and sex with freshly dead person. There was indeed a motive, a pathological need to kill and to gain personal pleasure from the act of killing. 
but Burns' lawyer, Leon Spies, fought successfully to keep the graphic computer searches from being used as evidence in the trial. We didn't think it was strong evidence of a motive. And with the computer searches kept out of the case, Spies was able to argue there was no evidence of a motive for this family man to target Michelle Martinko. He is a characteristic small town Iowa businessman with a great a group of children in his family. He's kind of the spitting image of a, a true Hawkeye. The biggest hurdle for the defense was the DNA evidence linking Burns to Michelle's dress. And Spees reminded the jury of his expert witness's testimony about how DNA can be transferred and is not infallible. This is not just phony stuff or something that was made up. This is important scientific information that's invaluable and necessary for your critical appraisal of all of the evidence in this case. And then finally, to those damning police interrogation tapes of Jerry Byrne. Much has been made about whether or not Jerry, in being questioned by Investigator Denlinger, denied that he had killed Michelle Martinko. Test the DNA. Why did this happen, Jerry? Test what, the DNA. What happened? I don't know. I you was don't, not there that night. You don't know why this happened? I was not there that night. I was not there that night. It cannot be said, with your allegiance to the law and the facts, that Jerry Burns is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Your verdict must be not guilty. The jury went out late in the day. Even the lead detective, Matt Dinglinger, worried the prosecution case had issues. Lack of witnesses, um, lack of a confession, um, lack of other things that connected Jerry to the crime scene or to Michelle. It was a long trial with lots of evidence, lots of exhibits. I've seen quick juries, I've seen juries that take longer, and I've seen hung juries. This was a quick jury. After about three hours of deliberations, the jury reached this verdict. The members of the jury, through the foreman, have signed verdict form number one. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jerry Lynn Burns. guilty of the charge of murder in the first degree. We were hugging each other, just joy, excitement, relief. Oh my goodness, relief. And in the wake of Burns' conviction, questions were now raised in Iowa about whether he could be linked to other unsolved murders and disappearances in the state. I field calls about that uh, to this day. Um, people calling in suspecting uh, Jerry somehow responsible for other crimes. And I'm open to that idea. Including the unsolved disappearance of an Iowa TV news anchor woman in 1995, Jody Husentrud. And if you take a picture of Michelle and of Jody Husentrud and you put them side by side, they're twins. Burns' lawyer says there is no evidence of any connection to any other crimes committed by his client whatsoever. Well, I think it's bizarre how a, a person could do something so brutal and not have other instances of doing something. And what about the still unsolved disappearance of Burns' cousin, Brian Burns? Brian, his own cousin, he disappeared off the face of the earth on December 19th on the anniversary of Michelle's murder. Pretty dead gum sure they got the right person for more than one reason. After a delay because of the COVID-19 pandemic, Jerry Burns in his orange prison jumpsuit and wearing a mask was back in court to hear his sentence. There is no death penalty in Iowa and he got the maximum possible life without parole. Jerry Lynn Burns, you are now remanded to the director of the Iowa Department of Corrections for the rest of your life. Even so, Michelle's family was not fully satisfied with the outcome. I think he did get away with it. I would have liked to have seen him uh, spend the rest of his life in prison starting with age 26, but it didn't happen. and. Uh, I'm at peace with that because we're just glad they caught him. We thought we'd die not knowing who did it. Now they do. She's forever 18. You know, she's forever just, 
that beautiful person.